We are now two projects and two variants into the MCU, shambling their way through the introduction of, and eventually a multiversal showdown with, Kang or Kangs. And I gotta tell you, I am not impressed. Today, during one of our world-famous lunch dates, Garrick and I were discussing the latest Marvel Cinematic Universe film to crush our hopes for the future, Ant-Man and Wasp Quantumania. While the film wasn't horrible, the sharp decline in quality and drastic increase in quantity of Marvel projects has left us with a new concern, and that concern is pretty simple. Is anyone really going to care about Kang? Is he really that threatening to the average moviegoer? And more importantly, is Kang going to be able to captivate audiences in the same way that Thanos was? Today's video is going to take a look at how Marvel was capable of building Thanos into a truly terrifying threat across a number of years, and how they are now struggling to create that same sense of impending dread with Kang. We are going to compare the current buildup towards Avengers Kang Dynasty and Secret Wars, and the previous peak of MCU content, Infinity War and Endgame. So suit up, strap in, shrink down into your seat with a snack, and um, let's rant about comic book film characters or something. While hindsight is 2020, the true goal of the first phase of the MCU was to bring together and establish the core Avengers team. Iron Man, Thor, Captain America, Black Widow, and Hawkeye. The first phase primarily functioned as a way of building towards a team-up film the likes of which had never been seen before, as the Avengers had a massive, knockdown, drag-out fight against Loki and the Chitauri forces in New York City for the fate of the planet. But ultimately, one of the most important aspects of the original Avengers film was setting the stage for the looming threat that would strike fear into the hearts of viewers for years, the mad titan himself Thanos. Shown briefly at the end of Avengers, we only get a small glimpse at the mad titan, but something about him already had me shooketh. And audiences resonated with that feeling. We had just witnessed the Battle of New York, been introduced to cosmic levels of power within the Tesseract, and a massive interstellar army of Chitari commanded by Loki, on loan from somebody with clearly immeasurable levels of power and influence. The grand influence of Thanos was then unwound over a series of projects over the course of the next few years. Guardians of the Galaxy gave us our first glimpse of Thanos in all of his regal glory, and reaffirmed how powerful he was by having just about every character within the cosmos being aware of and terrified of him. This character wasn't hiding. He was here, he was commanding, he was imposing, and you absolutely knew not to f with him. When a character as powerful and influential as a Kree accuser, aka Ronin, is left shivering in his boots, we knew that this guy meant business. At the end of Phase 2, we get another big glimpse of Thanos and the fabled Infinity Gauntlet, and his machinations start to take form. You know he's been working towards collecting the Infinity Stones, and we spend half a dozen projects getting to know those items and how powerful they truly are. By the end of Age of Ultron, we already had enough knowledge to know that you absolutely, positively did not want to see Thanos get those stones. What I'm trying to say here is, the buildup was slow, calculated, methodical, and scary. So let's pause on Thanos for a second and we'll come back to him in a few. Now let's discuss the introduction of Kang the Conqueror, or I guess I should say, the concept of Kang. The reason I say the concept of Kang is that the being who would become known as Kang the Conqueror wasn't actually named during our first run-in with him. Therein lies a serious problem with the looming threat of villainy, identity. The ability to put your finger on him and say, that guy, that guy right there, that's a bad guy. While not every story needs to be that direct, and Thanos was a masterful introduction in that style, there's a big difference in the eyes of the viewers between a shadowy looming threat and one with an insanely complex backstory. Kang is an incredibly complex character within the comics, and after spending years discussing comics with others and arguing with people on Twitter, he isn't a character that a lot of people seem super familiar with because his stories can be a bit jarring, complex, interwined, and retconned. It also doesn't help that every new writer to tackle Kang has a get out of jail free card just by claiming that a previous version of Kang wasn't actually the real one because whatever, put in whatever insane reason you want. He was actually a robot duplicate this whole time, or uh, he wasn't actually Kang, he was a variant that was a pharaoh, like whatever. 
This complexity carries over to the MCU, because to understand the concept of Kang within the MCU, you need to first become familiarized with the concept of the multiverse. So what exactly is the multiverse? It's a way of bringing back aging movie stars or have other heroes make guest cameos in these new movies so Disney can make a ton of money off of nostalgia bait and toy sales and so sorry, 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 that was, that was a different rant, that's another video. The multiverse within the MCU is the concept of infinite time streams, infinite versions of reality that possess limitless possibilities for different versions of heroes and villains we know and those we don't. The entire MCU has been told in a singular reality, and that reality resides within a grouping of multiversal realities known as the Sacred Timeline. The Sacred Timeline was created and maintained by a singular being, an unnamed overseer referred to as He Who Remains. Every single event within those timelines was carefully monitored by a body of time enforcers known as the Time Variance Authority, and those events were either allowed to occur in order to maintain the sacred timeline or those people, places, and entire realities were pruned to prevent a multiversal war across every reality. This multiversal war would occur between variants of the person who oversees the sacred timeline variants of a being known as He Who Remains, and there are quite the plentiful amounts of these variants just waiting to claw their way back into dominance. Now that is a lot to wrap your mind around, and we're only in the infancy of the multiverse as a concept within the MCU. Now keep in mind, everything that I just laid out was explained to us throughout the events of a singular conversation with He Who Remains in the season 1 finale of Loki. And at the end of that conversation with He Who Remains, he gives Loki and Sylvie an opportunity to keep the sacred timeline intact and oversee it, or kill him and open the proverbial floodgates. And of course they choose the latter. So all of that is the introduction to, um, hold on, let me check my notes. Okay, we didn't actually talk about Kang yet. That's, that's kind of weird, but okay. Okay, that seems weird, but Surely within the next six films that we have to watch, we will get more information on Kang. Those films being Black Widow, Shang-Chi, Spider-Man No Way Home, Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness, Thor Love and Thunder, and Black Panther Wakanda Forever. Okay, so uh, after re-watching those, it turns out we do not bring up He Who Remains or Kang at all whatsoever in these films. It's just crazy to think that Marvel didn't at least attempt to give us a glimpse at Kang during the events of either Spider-Man No Way Home or Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness, considering those movies are heavily predicated by our new understanding of the multiverse. And don't get my opinion twisted here, because I know some of you are greasing up your keyboard keys to write a doctoral thesis about why he shouldn't have been included. Um, actually, those stories didn't need Kang because it was not important to the overall story of Peter and, uh, da, be, you know, be, 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 MJ. And that's not what I'm saying at all. I'm not saying that He Who Remains needed to be a significant role in those films, but just an understanding that he was looming in the background or that he was doing something or influencing something, you know, around and observing. I'm not asking for a lot here, just a little wink, a nudge, a nod to his existence. However, finally... Finally, in Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania, we get a flashback to Janet Van Dyne's time spent in the Quantum Realm and the introduction of an ostracized and exiled variant of He Who Remains, who goes by the name Kang the Conqueror. We now, finally, have a true name that fans identify and a face to go with an evil version of this reality-jumping Time Lord. But here's the crazy part and the crux of the rest of the video. To me, Kang did not feel at all menacing upon his introduction. I mean, after all, he lost to Ant-Man. Was he powerful and a major threat to Scott? Sure, but if that version of Kang left the Quantum Realm, he's absolutely getting stomped by the Avengers that we still have hanging out, and it's not close. I'm not sure you're ready for my next statement, and maybe it's controversial. Kang needed to win in this movie, and he should have won in this movie. Kang needed to win for two simple reasons. First, to establish how much of an absolute unit he truly is, and second, to spice up the next few projects that Marvel has coming. By comparison, when we first see Thanos properly gassed up and ready to throw down, he faces off with and absolutely demolishes the Incredible Hulk and Thor at the same time. The two strongest Avengers, 
who just recently defeated the literal god of death on Sakaar, were both absolutely ragged on by the Mad Titan. Kang lost to Ant-Man and the Wasp, and I'm not saying Ant-Man and Wasp are weak characters, but they're certainly not as storied with accolades as the Jade Giant and the God of Thunder. When we first see Thanos, he beats Hulk into unconsciousness. He snaps Loki's neck in front of his brother. He beats Thor to a pulp and jettisons his body into the cold of space. He stabs Heimdall through the heart, killing him instantly. The man made waves. He cleaned house in space, space house. When Hulk arrives back on Earth, he's so shook by everything he had just seen, he's capable of rallying every available fractured Avenger together just to try and stop this onslaught. And they all lose. Everyone combined can't stop Thanos. He wins, and he wins massively. A fat W. And I know we're talking about the buildup of these characters, and that was years of buildup but not in the eyes of the characters who are experiencing it. To them, this guy's here now and wrecking shop. He won, he beat them all, he got what he wanted, dusted the universe and ghosted the galaxy to go be a space mango farmer. Yet when Kang arrives on the scene, the only characters we see him truly defeat in battle are unnamed goobers who live in the quantum realm. Nobodies, characters we have no emotional investment with whatever. Who cares about Broccoli Man and Quantum Caradoon? We're literally never going to see these characters again, they don't matter. Kang's true introduction in this film, and the reason that he should have beat Scott, and we should have seen him win this battle and escape the Quantum Realm, is because Kang violates a very simple premise within fiction. Show me, don't tell me. We are told over and over and over again within Quantumania that Kang is the end all be all. He has technology and power we can't possibly comprehend. He's laid waste to countless timelines. Janet says specifically that he has killed trillions of beings, but then he loses to Ant-Man and the Wasp. I mean, I'm sorry, but this is not adding up. This brings me to my second point. He needed to get out. He needed to start doing some truly dastardly in the multiverse. Spice things up a bit, really start causing havoc. The MCU needs to start feeling the consequences of the action that these villains take again. Villains like Loki, Hydra, and Thanos left huge marks on the world, and I'm worried we're going to walk into the next Avengers film and it's going to try and set up that conflict within the film and it'll be too much. I was hoping we would feel the conflict over one true Prime Kang messing with the multiverse for everybody. I really enjoy Ant-Man as a character, and his films are some of my personal favorites to rewatch, even though they are admittedly not all that great. But Kang should have absolutely defeated him and escaped the Quantum Realm. But Nick, you're missing the point. Part of the reason that Kang is so scary is because there are so many variants of him, said me to myself to imitate what you might be thinking of saying to me. And of course, I get that, but therein lies another problem. If you defeat multiple versions of Kang, you start to reduce his value as a villain in the eyes of your audience, who's probably already a bit confused about this character's overall threat level since they just watched Ant-Man steamroll him. If you repeat the same story beat, i.e. Kang variants losing to Avengers, his defeat loses impact. Audiences lose respect for him. The mid credit scene in the film showed us additional variants of Kang preparing an entire council of Kangs to do battle against the forces of the main Marvel 616 cinematic universe. Kang is known in the comics as being a strategic mastermind whose plans and machinations unwind slowly and methodically. That could be what's happening here as well, but it's very, very, very difficult to tell that as a viewer. We're left guessing if that's the last we've ever seen of him, or if he's even that threatening. How many of these jabronis are we going to have to beat before we get to one that's truly terrifying? Only time will tell who among these Kang variants may be a truly worthy adversary for the heroes we know and love, but one thing is for certain, Kang will not be Thanos. They have already fumbled his introduction and missed so many crucial elements of what they successfully did with Thanos. Maybe they have some grand plan for him that I'm missing, but right now, myself and the audience surely are not feeling that that's the case. That is about it for this video, but I want to know what you thought of the first two variants of Kang that we've seen in the MCU. And more importantly, do you feel like Kang is going to rise to the same pinnacle of villainy that Thanos was capable of? Thank you guys for watching this video. Remember to like and subscribe and do all that other crap that YouTubers ask you to do. This has been Nick from Key Issues. 
Thanks again. And remember the motto, Kang over everything.